William Marshall is perhaps the greatest knight to ever live. Now if you don't know who he is, William Marshall was a knight that served the English crown back in the 12th century. He is well known for his bravery, honor, and courage in battle, as well as his staunch loyalty to the crown and his men. Now William would be born around 1147 in Wiltshire to a lesser noble, John Marshall. Now during this time, England was going through the Anarchy Period, a period of time where the English throne was up for grabs and a massive civil war was going on. Now unfortunately for William, he would find himself as a hostage as his father had turned against the king at the time, who was King Stephen. And at the young age of five, King Stephen would sentence William to his death. However, lucky for William, the king would have a change of heart as William's innocence and interest in the knights and weapons around him warmed the king's cold heart and he just couldn't bring himself to kill the young boy. So instead, William was given pretty much free roam of the camp where he would run around and play with the knights and even the king himself. However, not long after this, the war would come to an end and William would be allowed to go back home. Now the rest of his childhood would go by pretty uneventfully. However, around 13, William would be sent to go live with his uncle in Normandy where he would finally learn how to be a knight. From there, he would be trained in all manners of combat from swords, axes, maces, horseback riding, and his personal favorite was the lamp. And in 1166, at the age of 20, William would finally complete his training and get knighted, becoming an official knight. However, this would not last long as immediately afterwards, he and his lord were headed off to go to war because Flanders had decided to invade Normandy. So William and his lord packed up the things and headed off to war. During his first battle, William would be so eager that his lord would actually tell him to sit back and stay there, not wanting the new guy up front. Yeah, I mean, pretty understandable. New guy, he's probably going to get his ass kicked. You don't want that to happen. William, however, not wanting to disappoint his lord, would go ahead and move to the back, although he was pretty beat up about it. I mean, he wants to go and kick some ass. He's not allowed to. But when the order was given to charge, he fucking flew out of there like a bat out of hell, and he would charge directly headfirst into the enemy's lines where he would fight tirelessly, kicking the ass of the Flanders soldiers with ease. However, he would eventually get separated from his lord and get wounded, as well as also have his armor heavily damaged and his horse even die. But William would eventually make it back to his lord where they would be successful in repelling the attack. Unfortunately for William, though, his lord wasn't too impressed. Despite the fact that he fought so hard that day, he didn't bring any captives. And unfortunately, the way you made money back then was by capturing people and ransoming them off. So William, now having a dead horse, damaged armor, and being wounded with nothing to show for it, was pretty much let go because he is seen as a liability and no one really wanted to pay for his shit. So unfortunately, William would be fired as soon as he was knighted, which kind of sucks, <laughs> not gonna lie. However, still wanting to make something of himself, William would head off to a nearby tournament with nothing more than his broken armor and an old horse that he was able to buy from selling his cloak. And with what little supplies he had, he packed up and he took off to the nearby tournament, trying to make a name for himself. And once at the tournament, William would actually be gifted a horse so he could at least stand somewhat of a chance against everyone. I mean, let's face it, back then, the way that tournaments worked is that it was basically team deathmatch and both sides came clashing down into one another. If you didn't have a horse, you're pretty much fucked. So he was given a horse to make things a little easy. However, this horse wasn't broken in yet. It is still pretty wild and unruly and it just made things difficult for William. But that wouldn't stop him, because he would go in and do extremely well in the tournament, capturing two opponents and winning four horses and a small amount of wealth and some new gear. So after this, William would start traveling around, competing in every tournament he could, earning himself a somewhat renown and a little bit of a fortune. After some time of doing this, William would eventually make his way back home to England, Earl Patrick of Salisbury, and it wouldn't be long till he and Lord Patrick would be called by the King of England to go to war as a group of rebels in Le Jean, I believe that's how you say it, I don't know French words, I'm sorry, would begin revolting. So William and his new lord would pack up, make their way to France, and from there they would be given the task to guard the Queen of England herself, Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine. However, this would not last long as tragedy would strike the young knight. Towards the end of the rebellion, the group would be ambushed by a group of Le Jean warriors, sorry, don't know how to pronounce that, where Earl Patrick would unfortunately be killed by a lance that was driven straight through his back. And this would send William into an absolute fit of rage.
He would charge headfirst into the enemy, cutting them down one by one, taking on anyone and everyone in his sight. He would fight so hard that the rest of his forces, as well as the queen herself, were able to get away while he held off the enemy by himself. Eventually, he would get cornered by around 60 men, but he would not give up. He would stand his ground and continue to fight, until one knight got a lucky shot on him and would be able to send a lance straight through his leg, bringing him down and allowing the other soldiers to capture him. And so, William would be stuck as a hostage for the next few months, fearing that his ransom would never be paid because, let's face it, he's just some low-level knight, there's no real renown to him. Yeah, he's a bit of a tournament guy, but he's not important by any means. And his leg, unfortunately, would never actually get the proper treatment that it needed. Matter of fact, what William would end up doing was ripping pieces off of his own clothes in order to keep the bleeding down. But then, some surprising news would come in, and his ransom had been paid, and he was able to go free. And who paid his ransom, you may ask? Well, it turns out it was none other than Queen Eleanor herself. From there, William will be given proper medical treatment, as well as a position in the Queen's own guard. This was tremendous luck for William, as just a few months ago, he was literally a nobody who had not even a penny to his name, to now serving the Queen of England herself. It's not entirely known why she took an interest in him, but it is believed that is because she saw how ferocious and how courageous he was in battle, and this was so much that it impressed the Queen and she wanted him for her personal guard. Around 1169, the fighting would calm down and William would accompany the Queen in 1170 to head back to England for a very important event. And that event was the crowning of King Henry the Younger. Now, the old king was still alive and this is where things are gonna get kind of confusing because the old king is also called King Henry and the, the young king is also King Henry. So we're gonna call him Old King Henry and Young King Henry just to make things a little easy. Now, the old king was still alive, and basically what he was trying to do at the time was separate his kingdom into three sections and giving each piece to one of his sons, so that way there wouldn't be any rebellion, they wouldn't be fighting each other, so on and so forth. We'll see how well that does in the future. However, the young King Henry was supposed to be next in line. Now, what they're basically going to do is a dual monarch. So there will be old king, and then there will be young king, and they just work together. Some weird convoluted mess. Turns out Young King was just nothing more but a puppet, so Old King could do whatever he wanted. Young King never actually got any of his power. Young King's pissed. We'll see how that goes in the future. Because of this, King Henry and Queen Eleanor would have William Marshall himself be Henry the Younger's personal trainer, giving him the responsibility to train and hone the Young King's battle prowess. Now, this must have been a massive surprise for William because at the time he was only like 23 years old. And just a few years ago, he was literally lordless and penniless, just traveling the land, competing in tournaments, trying to make ends meet. And now he is the personal trainer to the King of England's son, one of the most powerful people in all of Europe at this point. Good news is William and Henry would hit it off right away. The two became almost inseparable, forming a bond like that of brothers, if anything else. The two of them will go around competing in even more tournaments. However, it was only a matter of time till young King Henry won more power and would eventually turn on his father for the throne. At this point, William's gonna have to make a huge decision to stay loyal to the king or stay loyal to his friend. And William would choose to stay loyal to his friend, even to the point where Henry will want William himself to knight him, which again was weird because usually at this point, if you were to knight someone, you had to be a lord, which meant you had to own land in the very least. And William didn't own shit. Again, he's just a knight. He ain't got money. He ain't got land. He's just a trainer, but Henry believed in William so much and had so much respect for him that he wanted him, he wanted his friend William to be the one to knight him. And so therefore, William would. And so William did, he would knight the young King Henry. The two of them would rally their forces, get Henry's brothers on his side, and even get the backing of the King of France. Everything was looking good. They had a sizable force, they had strong allies, good men were siding with them. And so they would launch their attack against the old King. And they will get absolutely fucking slaughtered. <laughs> the old king was just far more experienced than any of his sons and would just absolutely crush them. They got their asses handed to him. And in 1174, after just about a year of fighting, the rebellion would be put down and Henry and his brothers would be forgiven, allowed back into their king's grace. 
However, they were kept on a short leash and would always be watched from that point on. Kind of understandable. They did try to fight their father. And at this point, William and Henry would go off and start just competing in tournaments everywhere they could. Henry was pretty much given no power and seeing that he had no real you know, authority, he was just, fuck it, let's just start competing. So they would travel all across France, Normandy, and even Ireland, entering every tournament they possibly could and doing extremely well in each, even outright winning most of them. To William, this point of his life was his most fondest of memories, traveling around the lands of his best friend, competing in every tournament and winning a large amount of money. Soon they would be doing so well that they would even invite other knights to join their retinue, forming a tournament team that they could compete with. And William would perform extremely well in all these tournaments, capturing up to 103 knights and beating 500 knights in combat. He got so good, in fact, that other lords started inviting William to their tournaments and homes. William would do so well that he would even be allowed to create his own banner, the golden green field with the red line on the front, which you can see right here. And these were William's happiest times. However, like all good things, this too will have to come to an end because William and Henry would end up having a bit of a falling out due to a rumor that supposedly William was sleeping with Henry's wife. And unfortunately, in 1183, the two would go on their separate ways. And for the first time in years, at the age of 36, William would once again be on his own. However, this too would not last long as Henry would call back William that these rumors were completely false and were fabricated by three knights that were just simply jealous of William. And so they would kick those three knights and William would come back just in time because yet another war had broken out, this time between Henry and his younger brother, Richard. Unfortunately, this war would not last long as Henry himself would grow deathly ill and pass away at the young age of 28. However, not before he and William made a promise. And that promise was William would pick up his cloak and cross and carry it with him to Jerusalem in the name of crusade in his honor. And so after talking to old King Henry, William would set off on crusade in September 1183. However, not much is known about his time on crusade other than that he had made very good friends with both the Knights Templars and the Knights Hospitallers and participated in a few skirmishes here and there. He did live up to his promise that he made his old friends and was able to drop the cross and the cloak off, burying him at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. And around late 1185, early 1186, William would return home from Crusade where he would enter the service of Old King Henry. From there, William would be awarded the modest state for his service. William, now approaching 40, has finally earned the title of Lord after all of his work. However, once again, war was brewing. This time, King Philip of France would be launching attacks against King Henry in 1187, and unfortunately, King Henry's son, Richard, will go in on the side of King Philip, bringing more and more nobles towards him. Even with so many of his allies swapping sides, William would still choose to stay loyal to King Henry. And for his loyalty, King Henry promised William Isabel of Clare, basically the closest thing to an Irish princess that you can get. And so in one last ditch effort to repel the French attack, the two of them will go to Le Mans with what little forces they had left and fortify their defenses there. And in 1189, Richard and Philip forces would show up and launch an attack on the city. William and his men would fight long and hard, beating back wave after wave of enemy soldiers and knights, trying with all their might to hold the city for as long as they could. However, the enemy's numbers would prove to be too great, and they would be pushed back towards the town square. From there, they would try to get their king out and make one last dish effort to escort their king out of the city. While on the run, they would be pursued by a group of knights, hell-bent on hunting them down. William and one other knight would turn their horses and face their pursuers, intending to hold them for as long as they could desperately trying to buy time for their king to escape. And so the two of them stood there waiting for the party to get to them. And lo and behold, Prince Richard is leading the charge. Seeing this, William would charge headfirst directly at Richard. Soon, one of the greatest clashes is about to go down. The greatest knight versus the warrior king. We're about to see who's the best. As William charged Richard, he would notice that Richard wasn't fully kitted out in his armor and not wanting to kill the heir, would instead lower his lance and aim for his horse running it through, killing it instantly. Richard would go flying, toppling to the ground, where he would quickly leap to his feet and halt the search party, allowing William and the other knight to get away. Richard, fully knowing that his men were fully outclassed by William and would stand no chance at fighting him. However, this war would not last for much longer, as King Henry's health took a turn for the worse and his body had finally started to shut down on him in his old age. 
In July 1189, he would pass away. After his death, William and his men would carry the king's body to the local abbey and call upon Richard, letting him know that his father had died. Richard would soon make his way to the abbey where he would look upon his father's corpse with a stone face. After a few minutes, he would ask to speak with William outside alone. William at this point probably thought he was fucked. In all honesty, I mean, he did just try to kill Richard just a few days ago. And Richard is now going to become king. And that's not looking too good, if I do say so myself. So William, for all intents and purposes, was fucked. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm probably going to die now. And he was right. Richard would stand there and confront him about the previous day. And I quote, Marshall, the other day you intended to kill me. And you would have, without a doubt, if I had not deflected it with my arm. In which case, William's response was, and I quote, It was never my intention to kill you. I am still strong enough to direct my lance, and if, if I wanted to, I would have driven it straight through your body just as I did that horse of yours. And oh boy. <laughs> like, oh shit. Um, I would love to know what was running through William's head at this point when he said that. Because he's basically saying, if I wanted you dead, you'd be dead, you little shit. And he stared Richard right in the fucking eyes when he said this. But regardless of what he may have thought, whatever it was, it must have worked because immediately after, Richard would actually forgive him. And not only that, he would employ William into his own court. And from there, the war would be over and Richard would be crowned king. Even holding true to his father's promise and handing over Isabel of Clare to William to marry which the two would do so soon after, and the two would remain happily married till their deaths and even pop out ten children, five boys and five girls. This marriage would also make William one of the most powerful people in the kingdom as he now controlled lands in Ireland and Wales on top of what he already had, and everything that we know about William was that he was a pretty good ruler, building walls and churches in all these lands, even building up castles whose sole purpose was to teach and train people to become knights. So William, has now come full circle from being a penniless knight to now a teacher in the arms and helping others to become the best warriors they could possibly be, which is pretty fucking cool, honestly. And as this was going on, Richard the Lionheart would set off on crusade, trusting William to keep an eye on his little brother, Prince John. Yes, the Prince John from Robin Hood, which proved to be harder than he thought because Prince John was a giant piece of shit antagonizing nobles, overtaxing the shit out of people, and even just allowing friends to invade and while all this was going down, William is just trying to hold the kingdom together. You know, he's trying to calm things down, trying to get nobles to stay on their side, just doing everything he possibly can to keep the fires of war away, which unfortunately wasn't all that great because the whole land at this point was now in open rebellion against Prince John. However, Richard would finally return home and the two would work together, beating back the French and the rebels, as well as stabilizing the lands all while forming a pretty close bond in respect for each other. And these are two guys that were literally trying to kill each other just a few years ago, and now they're acting like they're best friends, which, I mean, who could blame them? Warriors respect warriors. Both are really damn good in this trade, so of course they would form a pretty strong friendship. However, this would not last long either, as in one battle, Richard would get shot by a crossbow, and unfortunately the wound will grow infectious, and Richard the Lionheart would pass away on April 6, 1199, at the age of 41. And his death would shock William to the core, bringing him to tears. And now, the sleazy-ass Prince John would become king. And guess what? His rule is just as bad as you think it would. Yep. He overtaxed the subjects, ripped lands away from the nobility class, alienated himself from everyone, and as cruel and petty as he can be. This makes him one of the hardest kings to even be around, let alone serve, and he is William's new boss. And just as you think, the two did not get along whatsoever. And to make the matters worse, France starts invading English lands again in 1202, and William has to go down there to stop them. And he does pretty damn well. He starts pushing the French back, recapturing the lands that they lost. Even when they were outnumbered, William and his men are able to push the French back more and more. And then King John gets involved and fucks everything up. He starts fucking with their plans, pissing off nobles and losing battles, torturing the shit out of people. And at this point, all the nobles that were once loyal to England are now just 
swapping sides. They're just like, fuck this. We're not working with John. He's a piece of shit. France is better. We're siding with them. And England would just start losing lands left and right. And soon England starts losing all their continental lands as nobles start swapping sides. And France is just conquering place after place. Just not giving a shit. Going on a rampage. And eventually, William and Prince John will have to pull back to mainland England as they have now lost all of their continental lands, including Normandy. And you would think at this point, John would learn his lesson, but no. He goes right back to fucking with people, even with William trying to take his lands and just being a massive pain in the ass. Now, luckily for William, his knights were far more loyal to him than they were to the king. So John's forces were never actually able to capture any of William's lands in Wales or Ireland as William's guys just held him off. This would drive an even bigger wedge between the two, and for a while, they would just not even talk to each other. However, it would be only a matter of time till John will have to call upon William once again, because as of 1212, John had pissed off so many of the nobles, and they were so fed up with his bullshit that they were now openly rebelling against him. And he will call upon William to come and completely unfuck the situation. William tries his best, gathering all the royals and rebels alike, and is able to create the document that we know today as the Magna Carta in 1215, which is an early form of a constitution, a document that makes it clear what a king can and can't do, what the nobles are allowed to do, and what the people of England's rights are. However, this document is not all that great, and no one really is happy with it, especially King John, as he just had to sacrifice a ton of his power. And because of that, being the little bitch that he is, John starts raiding all the nobles' lands pretty much instantly right after signing it, kicking off the entire civil war. <laughs> and to make things even worse, France, again smelling blood in the water, launches a full-scale invasion into mainland England in 1216. And they're able to pretty much march their armies all the way up and take London, as well as and pretty much all of southern England in a matter of months. Meanwhile, William is just looking around at this absolute shit show that John created and just trying to do his best to calm things down. However, good news does come in. And that good news is, is that on October 18th, 1216, King John will finally fucking die. Good friends. God, that guy was a piece of shit. And everyone, and I mean everybody, was fucking happy about this. It was fantastic that this guy was finally dead. Because, because now we can actually get a competent king. And that comes with the next problem. The only surviving heir to the crown is a nine-year-old. Like no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Yep. So, at this point, pretty much every noble is just completely noped out. They're like, nope, fuck this, we're joining France. This isn't great, we're either rebelling or we're joining France. We're not leaving our trust in a nine-year-old boy because he's just gonna ruin everything because he's a fucking child and doesn't know what the hell he's doing. The realm is on fire, rebels are running around freely, France is just blitzing across the country, and William now has to decide whether or not he's gonna stay loyal to the king or join France, which probably is the smart decision because France is actually competent. Meanwhile, England is just falling apart. But William does the unthinkable. He stays loyal to the kid. And in an extreme act of chivalry and loyalty, William Marshall would fully back the young King Henry, and this would shock everybody, including the boy King Henry, as he he would break down in tears over this. And so, at this point, William now has to come up with a plan because he's pretty much the only one in charge of the military now, because the only leader now is a nine-year-old boy and a handful of loyalists. They are completely outmatched and outmanned by everyone, including the rebels. And William has to come up with a plan. After all, the realm is still on fire, and at this point, he's 70 years old and has to unfuck this whole situation. So he sets his eyes on city of Lincoln. Why? Because Prince Louis of France, wanting to speed up the conquest of England, had split his forces into two at this time, sending one force up north while the other force stayed down south with him. Knowing that he doesn't have enough men to take on both forces at once, William would instead take them on one at a time. 
and William saw this as his opportunity to attack and would do so on May 20th, 1217. So the French were already laying siege to the city and had made their way through the first layer of walls and were slowly chipping away at the second layer of walls. Thankfully, the garrison inside the city was still alive and still kicking, and they were trying to hold back the French as long as they can, just pestering them as much as they could. William, seeing an opportunity, was able to send a small unit of crossbowmen up to one of the northern gates that had rubble on it. Once it was all cleared, William, at 70 fucking years old, would charge head first, leading his men into the city, being the first one in. And he will go on an absolute rampage, cutting down night after night, soldier after soldier, and being an absolute fucking tank, taking blow after blow after blow, never yielding to anyone. So Grandpa over here is pretty much just showing the young guys what a real knight is capable of, and he's just mercilessly beating the ever-living shit out of the French. It gets so bad for the French that once their commander is killed, they go into a full-on route and try to leave the city. However, they get choke point on the bridge leading into the city and are now basically just sitting ducks. And the English just tear into them, ripping them apart. And out of the original 1,600 French men that were there, only 200 were able to escape. While William and his forces received little casualties. It was a huge victory for the English and William Marshall. And it would not be long after this that Prince Louis of France would have to surrender as his reinforcements that he asked for got attacked by the English Navy, never being able to step foot on the mainland England. And in September 12, 17, Louis of France would surrender and head home to France, leaving William Marshall victorious. And from this point on, he would be referred as the Guardian of the Realm. After this monumental victory, William Marshall will help the young boy king seize the realm, even going as far as rewriting the Magna Carta, this time making it much more fair for all parties involved. And by 1219, at the age of 72, William Marshall would finally retire from office and head back home. However, his retirement would not last long as he would soon grow ill and knew that his death was coming for him. So he would settle his will, making sure that all of his children and grandchildren were well taken care of. And while on his deathbed, he would be visited by the young king as well as all the knights and nobles of the land all coming to pay their respects to this incredible man. And one of these people just so happened to be a longtime old friend of his, again, sorry for the pronunciation, Anamiri of St. Mora. Again, I can't pronounce shit. The head of the Knights Templar chapter in England. And at this point, William Marshall will hold true to his promise he made his friend all those years ago back in Jerusalem, and he would take the oath and become an official member of the Knights Templar. And on May 14th, 1219, William Marshall, the guardian of the realm, would pass away peacefully surrounded by loved ones. His body would be carried and laid to rest in the Temple of London, where it still rests to this day. Stephon Legton, the Archbishop of Canterbury, will go on to call William Marshall the greatest knight to be found in the world, and I can't help but agree more. In conclusion, this was the story of William Marshall, a man who started close to nothing and through hard work and dedication would save the English realm and become the greatest knight to ever live. And thank you for watching. If you found this video interesting, please give it a like. And if you want me to cover someone in history that you think is pretty interesting, please give me a recommendation down in the comments below. The best way to support this channel is to simply subscribe and I much appreciate it. And I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.